Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the second in a series of webinars organized and proudly brought to you by Thomastic Life Sciences Accelerator. My name is Ernest, and I'll be the moderator for this webinar. Our discussion today covers a topic that has gained prominence recently. Will COVID-19 vaccines be 100% effective? And can monoclonal antibodies end this pandemic instead? For those who are joining us for the first time, Thomastic Life Sciences Accelerator, TLA for short, is a joint venture between Thomastic Life Sciences Laboratory and Vertex Ventures. Established in 2016, we at TLA incubate, nurture, and grow disruptive life science innovations into early stage companies. TLA is one of the first deep synthetic biology and agri food tech incubators in Singapore. We offer a venture capital fund, an in house pre startup program, and an investment partnership with SIDS Capital. Our goals are three pronged create meaningful discussions showcase innovation breakthroughs, and facilitate knowledge sharing. We invite interested companies and individuals to reach out to us anytime. Since the onset of COVID-19, over 18 million cases have been reported in the global tally. Death cases continue to surge, and the increase in active cases sees no signs of abating. The top 10 worst affected countries include economic powerhouses across the continents. The situations in these countries continue to be worrying. With millions of lives at stake, the race to find an effective vaccine is on. Some vaccine developments have shown promise, but much more work is needed. Therapies and drugs may continue to be the default options in these urgent circumstances. We are joining us on a webinar today, the CEOs of two companies who have done exceptional work on monoclonal antibodies. They join us to share their research developments as well as their thoughts on the landscape. For view only participants on Zoom, you can post your questions via the Q&A function. We will try to answer as many of your questions in the Q&A segment. Our first panelist, Piers Ingram, is the CEO of Hummingbird. Hummingbird is on a mission to unravel the complexities of human disease. Hummingbird uses systems biology to develop insights into diseases so that the company can discover and engineer breakthroughs in biotherapeutics. Our second panelist, Inesha Asiao, is the CEO of DotBio. DotBio has developed antibody therapies that target cancer tumors and re-establish an effective immune system response. DotBio has also developed proprietary technologies to rapidly generate multi-specific antibodies. Both Hummingbird and DotBio are housed within TLA premises. We offer them infrastructural and operational support through TLA's incubator program. All right, what are monoclonal antibodies? They are in a nutshell, synthetically produced molecules engineered to serve as substitute antibodies that can restore and enhance a patient's immune system. Now let's close the presentation and turn our attention to the speakers, Pierce and Ignacio. Hey there. <laughs> Good Glad to be here. Pierce and Ignacio, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Our pleasure. Now, gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic has inspired an urgent search for prevention and treatment. Attention has focused on the development of vaccines, new antiviral therapies, and covalescent plasma infusions. Monoclonal antibodies have received less attention, even though neutralizing antibodies are a key component of protective immunity. So, peers, to set the stage, can you share with us Hummingbird's work prior to COVID-19? so that we can understand the context of monoclonal antibodies in your field of research. Sure, thanks, Ernest. Um, so Hummingbird is a, um, I guess, a very typical biotech company um, in this space, um, working on the discovery and development of therapeutic monoclonal antibodies. Um, typically, 
you know, in a non-pandemic situation, um, we're, we're focused on, um, I, I think, many of the same indications that, uh, that dot bio are. Um, so antibodies as treatments for cancers, um, autoimmune diseases, um, and so forth. And uh, as, a, as a company, we have the, the capabilities for antibody discovery um, and development, um, including taking programs into the clinic um, to test the, the efficacy and safety um, of our potential therapies um, in the clinic, with the eventual goal, of course, to, to get approval and, and to have a new therapy um, for, for unmet needs. Sure. Thanks, Bill, for the introduction. So, in sure, a similar question for you. To help us understand the context of monoclonal antibodies in your field of research, can you share with us the work that DotBio has done? Yes, uh, of course. Uh, so, DotBio is a company that focuses uh, primarily on protein engineering and antibody engineering. And we are building a platform technology where we integrate different kind of uh, state-of-the-art technologies to generate a new generation of antibodies. And currently we are focusing on one particular area, which is multi-specific antibodies. So these are bispecific antibodies or tri-specific antibodies, which are molecules that can target two or three things related to a particular disease at the same time. Uh, for example, if you're treating uh, a cancer, it may target a growth receptor linked to the growth of the cancer, and at the same time, um, activate the immune system to fight back against cancer, for example, or uh, targeting a growth receptor of the cancer and at the same time uh, uh, preventing the resistance mechanism involved in uh, cancer evasion uh, towards the immune system, for example. And that's in a nutshell what we do. Uh, we are focusing on cancer, but the technology is applicable to many uh, different conditions and we are uh, constantly expanding uh, those, those areas and, and, and our technology uh, advantage, if you will. All right, thanks a lot, Inisho. So the world is transfixed by this high stakes race to develop a COVID-19 vaccine. And we know from global medical experts that monoclonal antibodies have the potential to be an important bridge until a vaccine is available in 2021. So, Inisho, can you walk us through how monoclonal antibodies can function against COVID-19? How similar or different is it compared to monoclonal antibodies for immuno-oncology therapies? Yeah, uh, so uh, I would say that, you know, just so that the audience perhaps understand the context, antibodies is a natural response to a uh, pathogen, for example, something foreign from the body, right? And when we encounter a virus or perhaps a bacteria, the body would react to that. And one of the ways it fights back is by developing antibodies that would perhaps block that particular pathogen. And that response takes a little bit of time, especially if it's the first time we're encountering that pathogen. And so um, the typical response would be between seven and 20 days, depending on the strength of the response. And so what people in the industry are doing is making antibodies synthetically instead right? Designing them beforehand and then design the mechanism of action so that they can treat a particular disease. So in, in the case of, uh, you know, COVID, uh, many of the treatments are targeting uh, a receptor, uh, the spike protein that, that targets a receptor in, in, in the patient's cells and blocking that spike protein, for example. In the case of cancer, it's similar, except the targets are different. Uh, we are targeting and blocking perhaps a receptor involved in growth for the cancer, for example. So there's a lot of similarities and the technologies and the know-how that's available for many years of developing these different uh, antibody therapies can be applied to uh, COVID treatment. So, and, and that is helping speed up the process of developing um, new antibody-based COVID treatments nowadays. All right, so the difference really lies in where the target is supposed to be. Yes, it would be more on the biology side. The, uh, the mechanisms by which the antibodies work tend to be similar. There are a few known mechanisms. In this case, we're looking at blockade, for example. And so in, uh, the, the main goal for the scientists is to block strongly uh, the, the COVID uh, virus in this case, right? The, uh, and then the spike protein. But overall, the approach is fair, fairly similar to what has been done for the last perhaps 30 years. And so there's a very clear understanding of how to develop 
these kind of drugs. All right. Okay. Well, you know, to keep this uh, webinar interactive, we are going to poll the audience as well. So let's have our first audience poll one. All right. So among vaccines, antiviral therapies, as well as monoclonal antibodies, which do you think holds the greatest promise as a solution for COVID-19? Do we have the results? Okay. It shows that 64% you know, believe that vaccines hold the greatest promise as a solution. So, Piers, can you share with us from your knowledge and based on you know, the audience response, which among monoclonal antibodies, vaccines and antiviral therapies do you think has greater promise? Yeah, I, um, I just voted for vaccines as well um, in, that, <laughs> uh, in that poll. <laughs> I think, um, I, you know, kind of with the majority um, on this, um, but I, I think the, the point is um, that, you know, there's a patchwork of different needs and um, monoclonal antibodies uh, probably have a very important role to play. Um, you know, it, it, it's not kind of um, a silver bullet that's going to dissolve this for us. The, the, the challenge for um, vaccines is, of course, you know, I think kind of widely understood that we're developing these, um, you know, kind of at, at speed with... Um, I think so far very good success. Um, I, it's very encouraging to see how the vaccine programs um, are, are progressing. We, I think we're in some sense quite lucky that um, COVID seems so far to be a relatively easy um, target for a vaccine in terms of the spike protein. It doesn't seem to mutate too much. It seems to elicit a fairly good um, vaccine response. Um, but I, I think the, the, you know, the, the challenge is twofold. Um, I, First, we, we don't know how long those responses will really last. Um, and, you know, could it be that uh, responses fade fairly quickly? Um, I, I think time will tell on that. Um, but I think, as we know, you can, you can always have boosters, and, and we do for many vaccines. So that's not such a big issue. I, I think mm -hmm. the, the bigger concern and the, the role for um, antibodies, as, as I understand it, is um, more in people who are um, perhaps a little bit uh, more frail um, and less able to mount a, a strong uh, vaccine response, uh, particularly um, the elderly or immunocompromised, um, who are unfortunately also the people who are um, kind of most at risk of severe forms of, of COVID. Um, I think we all, all know that uh, as we age, our immune responses um, become a little bit less uh, vigorous. Um, mm. And so what we, what we don't want to end up with is a situation where and the, the young and the healthy have a, have a great vaccine response, but um, you know, some of the more at-risk populations um, really don't have um, good solutions. And I, I, I do believe that um, the antibodies, both in the, in the treatment and the, the prophylactic setting, um, probably have real, real value there. Mm. All right. Um, but Piers, you know, just thinking out loud, should greater emphasis be placed on developing new therapeutics instead of vaccines? so that this can position us better for future pandemics? I think, um, you know, if we look at what's going on right now in the antibody development space, um, I can assure you it's, it's a very, uh, very active field. There's, there's um, you know, incredible resources being poured into this. Um, as, a, as, a, as a response. Um, I think some places, some, some countries, um, some companies have done a very good job of preparing for this and um, working on a, a pandemic response um, plan that involves antibodies. And I think that, you know, that's been quite difficult for them to justify sometimes to, um, uh, to the funders. You know, how often uh, does a pandemic come along? You know, it's, it's uh, like preparing for an asteroid to hit, right? You know, you, mm. you do all of this preparation and it's, it's always just in case. Um, I, I think, you know, those, uh, those groups have clearly been shown to be um, very uh, foresightful. And I, I think, you know, we're, um, we're in a pretty good position um, because some of those companies have done that. Um, some of the funding agencies have supported those. Um, I think, you know, looking to the next five to 10 years, um, will there be more emphasis placed on this? Could we do better? Could we go faster? For sure. Um, I think there will be a lot of lessons learned. Right. Now, you know, pharmaceuticals, they are sharing information on their manufacturing capabilities, the capacity, the raw materials, and other supplies needed to manufacture effective monoclonal antibodies. 
the only two things that they cannot collaborate on because of antitrust regulations are uh, production costs and pricing. So Pierce, you know, based on your experience, what are the major issues for the development of a monoclonal antibody, even if different companies are open to collaboration? I think the collaborations have, have fantastic value. And, uh, you know, we've um, experienced firsthand um, in the work that we've been doing, um, you know, great reach out um, kind of ac across the stages of development. You know, there are, there are many uh, parties involved in, in making and testing um, of antibodies and, and releasing um, them for, for clinical use. And there are many steps that a, a classical program would have to go through, which you know, typically takes 18 to 24 months as a, as a bare minimum. Um, we've, we've seen the kind of the fantastic collaboration um, that, that groups have um, been willing to put in to, to make this, this process um, far, far shorter. Um, and otherwise it wouldn't have been possible. Um, there are limits, though, um, you know, the kind of the concepts of platform technologies and, and approaches that different people take. Not, not, um, not every system is interchangeable. And so, you know, you kind of operate slightly within different ecosystems of, of certain manufacturers um, at, at different stages of production. So there are, there are limits um, there to, to kind of how you can um, quickly switch around, even if somebody tells you, you know, a, a fantastic insight um, it could still take you, you know, quite a while to adopt that new technology and, and, and shift. Um, but overall, I, I think the, um, the collaboration has, has been um, phenomenal. Mm, all right. So initially, you know, just to build on the question as, as well as the response from peers, the sense that, you know, so many companies, they are developing monoclonal antibodies and we will eventually have a burden of choice. So how do we determine whether one monoclonal antibody is more effective than another antibody? Mm. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. So, you know, there are about nine or 10 uh, monoclonal antibodies right now in clinical development. And there are many more in um, preclinical development. Um, some of the ones that we've seen in the news here in Singapore include Tycan, uh, that is in clinical, entering clinical development now. And then I believe there's been a great work from people at DSO also developing other antibodies preclinically. And, uh, you know, how, how to judge which one would be um, best is very hard at this point. But I guess the first question is which ones would reach the finish line first, right? Mm -hmm. Because the first one to reach the finish line would have, uh, you know, be, be able to be tested on more patients and people would be, you know, really interested or, or willing to, to, to take those drugs and test them on different patients and start treating. So that first comer, what we call the first in class, would have a certain advantage of you know, being used more often. But then the second group of molecules that may be uh, coming a bit later, just behind uh, in development, may uh, become uh, the favorite choice if they have certain benefits. And in the industry, we talk of a first in class, sorry, best in class in this case. And so in this case, it could be many different things. Of course, potency and the uh, efficacy of those drugs would be very important. Uh, the duration of, of the drug response would of course be very important as well. And also uh, whoever is developing these drugs would have to have the, uh, you know, the production capabilities and also the distribution capabilities to be able to reach as many patients as possible. So all these elements would play an important role in deciding which drug would a particular country uh, start giving to its patients, for example. And of course, price also comes into that, that question, uh, depending on the income that different countries may have. And that's, I guess, a broader question also behind the cost of different uh, antibody treatments or, or vaccines and so on. But I, I believe the first one to reach the finish line would have a certain advantage that would be implemented first. And then just after that, the best one, if and as long as we can distribute it and produce it in, in large amount quantities, could then um, be the, the preferred choice over time uh, for people to use. All right. So the first mover does not always get the best advantages. Well, there is, there is an advantage because we are in a situation where it's uh, you know um, an emergency, and people have ignored in many ways all the economic calculations that typically we have to do 
to bring a drug to patients, right? People have really focused, the biotech community overall have decided this uh, uh, special situation and we have to put our best efforts to pursue these drugs and just push as fast as we can and as best as we can to reach patients and benefit patients. So it's a very unique situation. And of course, the first one to reach there would have the benefit of being able to distribute that drug to more patients. But probably at the end of the day, we will still choose in the longer term, the best option, right? So once the other options come into place. Right, thank you. Now, the manufacturing of monoclonal antibodies is complex and capacity is limited. There is also a debate over whether a single antibody is powerful enough or whether a dual antibody combination is better. After all, it's the different spike proteins that gives this virus its crown, its corona. So, Pierce, can you comment on whether we may need a cocktail of monoclonal antibodies given the different spike proteins and the possible mutations? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, I, I, I see one of the questions on the, on the Q&A is also kind of regarding the, the strains in circulation. Um, I, I think if we, if we look at a, um, a single strain, can an antibody overcome that? The, the data so far suggests yes, absolutely. Um, the, uh, the in vitro data, the in vivo data um, strongly suggests that a, a single monoclonal antibody can be, can be very effective um, as long as it's sufficiently potent in, in blocking that spike receptor interaction. Um, and that, that's great. Um, the, the second thing is, well, what if there's a mutation? Um, as, you know, these, these different strains that emerge, can, can we mutate away from that? Um, and that's something I can assure you that um, is, is being kind of very heavily studied. Um, there's a lot of um, effort to understand um, and to, to make these spike proteins with the different mutations um, and ensure that the antibodies that are in development continue to bind. So the majority of antibodies that people have put forward so far um, bind in a particular region of the, the spike protein um, called the, the so-called receptor binding domain, um, mm -hmm. which is really critical for its interaction um, with the, uh, the ACE2 receptor. Um, and there's a, a lot of evolutionary pressure on um, that region to, to be maintained and to have a relatively low rate um, of mutations because it's so important functionally. You know, there are, uh, in a large protein, you know, a, a lot of residues, um, a lot of positions on the protein, um, which could change without maybe having too much impact. Um, and they would be kind of bad places to have an antibody um, against because it would be relatively um, efficient for the, for the virus to, to mutate. Um, there would be a low cost, um, but these ones in the, in the receptor binding domain, which tend to be the majority of the functional ones, um, are, are more conserved. So, so far we've, we've seen um, uh, you know, hundreds of different um, mutations at, at different sites, pretty good conservation. And the main antibodies that people are developing um, are those that um, I've seen the data for, um, they, they, they bind kind of across all of the different um, strains, um, with one or two very small exceptions. Okay. So just to, just to, to finish, the, the advantage of the, um, of the cocktail, of course, if you have two different epitopes, you, you wouldn't have that escape. Um, but the, the cost of manufacturing of a cocktail is, is very significantly higher. Mm. Um, and uh, so it could be, rather than making a cocktail, better just to prepare um, a couple of different um, antibodies and, and treat with, with the single one um, and then switch to the second one were that strain to become important. So I don't see it as a major concern. All right. So in your opinion, a single antibody would be sufficient for a start? I, I, think, it's a, I think it's a very solid start. Um, in the longer run, we may think, um, as you said, there are first, second, third generations of, of programs um, which, which we can continue to think about how to develop. But I, I don't think we need to kind of overly worry about solving kind of for the end state. At the moment, we, we, we just need something that works. Mm. All right. So um, initial, we have read of companies that have modified antibodies to make it more potent. One example of a modification is the slowing of the antibody degradation to give it a longer effective life. So from your experience, especially for your work in DotBio, what are your comments on molecular modeling and modification? 
Um, I guess, uh, going back to my previous comment, uh, we are benefiting from perhaps 30 years of experience in antibody engineering. Mm -hmm. And over time, the know-how has increased and we know how to modify and manipulate antibodies to give them the optimal properties. Uh, this includes affinity maturation, for example, to increase the potency. Having a clear understanding of where our antibodies bind towards the target, what we call the epitope, mm -hmm. uh, is also very important and understanding how to design an antibody that binds to the optimal epitope. And it, it, it goes back to what Pierce was mentioning just now, uh, you know, in the case of COVID, uh, is the receptor binding domain that seems to be very important. And then people understand that. And there's also information from the structure biology uh, community that gives additional information around which areas to target, for example. So all that helps to, to better design drugs. And there are other things that can also be improved. Uh, for example, the half-life extension that can be done by engineering other parts of the antibody, the FC part of the antibody that allows to extend half-life, for example, by engineering uh, one particular receptor that is called the FC neonatal receptor. Um, or by uh, increasing the potency in certain cases where you modi modify then uh, the, the recruitment of other receptors that, that activate the immune system. Um, so, you know, we have many years of experience and people know how to engineer antibodies to give them the right uh, properties and improve them in a particular way based on a particular design and a particular mode of action that we want for that antibody. So in the case of COVID, for example, what we mentioned before, uh, a long uh, duration of the, of the effectiveness of that antibody by extending what we call the half-life of the antibody could be beneficial, especially if we consider a prophylactic uh, type of approach, right? So all this, it, it, we are benefiting from many years of experience. And I believe this particular pandemic would help us be prepared for if there is a new one down the line where we'll be able to work faster the same way as, for example, Singapore benefited from when SARS happened and then the whole country improved its infrastructure and its protocols and so on to, to be better prepared. The same is happening in the antibody world, but we are constantly improving our know-how and, and can make now better and better antibodies to, to treat people and, 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 you know, and solve this kind of very challenging issues like a pandemic, for example. All right. Okay. So, um, well, how about, you know, let's keep this interactive, continue to keep it interactive and let's go into our audience poll number two, just to let the audience answer a question, another question. Can a monoclonal antibody developed for the treatment of COVID-19 be the same as the antibody de developed for preventive measures? Yes or no? Oh, it's split. 50-50, <laughs> wow. <laughs> split down the middle. <laughs> All right, Initial, can you comment on this audience poll? Yes. Um, in my view, yes. The, for me, the answer is yes, and I've answered that in, in, my, uh, in my poll as well. Um, the, the antibody could be used for both as long as it has certain properties that allow it to do that. Uh, on one side, it has to be quite potent, and on the other side, it has to have a prolonged effect. Um, there will be differences, though, uh, and considerations to take into account, and this has to be, do with uh, manufacturing-related um, and formulation-related uh, concerns. You know, can the antibody be concentrated enough, for example, to do an intramuscular injection rather than an intravenous injection? Um, you know, um, how long is the duration of the response once you inject into patients? And, and, and you know, it has to be sufficiently long to, so that it's considered prophylactic. But with the right properties, the same antibody could be used for both. Yes, I do believe so. Okay, all right. Okay, so um, we want to, you know, go into questions which are, you know, slightly more complex. And we want to address this elephant in the room. And it's about the cost of monoclonal antibodies and the eventual pricing. The more antibodies needed, the more difficult the manufacturing issues, and therefore this translates into a higher price. So, Piers, would this pricing for monoclonal antibodies be out of reach for the masses? How do we make it financially accessible for low and middle income countries? Sure. I think um, 
<laughs> like obviously great question and and uh, pricing and, and market access for, uh, for therapeutics is, is a perennial question um, and I think as a society we we've, we're, we're far from a, a fair and equitable solution right where everybody gets the medicines they need uh, I think in the case of COVID it's it's somewhat simplified by um, the economic calculations from the government that um, you know the um, the cost of the economy of, of not having vaccines and therapies um, are, are so extraordinary that um, there's, there's very strong willingness from governments to ensure that, that these are paid for. Um, and I think manufacturers um, uh, have been very willing to, um, to do work at cost um, just to ensure that, you know, business and life continues um, as per relatively normal. Um, so I, I think in the same way that uh, you know, Ignacio mentioned earlier that you know, many of the typical kind of business case considerations of developing a new drug have been thrown out of the window and the, the community has been very focused on, on getting the job done. Um, what we see in the news um, is I, I think the experience that most companies have, which is resources are not really a consideration here. It, it's about getting something that, that's usable um, and mass producing it and funding will be, will be found for it if it's, if it's good enough. I think the key obviously is to make sure that, um, that that isn't abused, that you know there's no price gorging or other um, poor behavior um, from the companies. Um, but you know, in, in this case, um, I, I think many of the classic rules of, of the biotech business just really don't apply. Mm. But will monoclonal antibodies ultimately be more expensive compared to vaccines? Uh, that's a bit of an unknown. There's, there's no real reason for them to be. Um, I think it depends on um, some of the factors we were talking about earlier, um, uh, the half-life and the potency um, of these, you know, depending on which of the vaccines are eventually produced, actually they're, they're very similar to um, uh, an antibody in terms of how they're manufactured in, in, in bioprocessing plants, um, et cetera. If, as we said, a vaccine has um, you know, a, a relatively limited um, kind of period of which it protects people, perhaps you know, one, one year, something like that, um, before you need a booster, which is, is possible, um, you know, we, we see um, antibody technologies, those half-life extensions, um, and very, very potent antibodies, which are effective, which, which may protect people for six months. Um, and so the, the, the numbers are not wildly off. Um, now, if, if the vaccines can be, um, you know, confer lifelong immunity at very low doses, um, then that will change. Um, and that's obviously the, um, the, the promise of, of vaccines. And I, I think what we all hope for uh, because I am pretty sure that none of us want to be in the kind of lifelong um, production of, of COVID antibodies um, again. But I, I think they're, they're similar. Mm. All right. So, Inisha, turning over to you, it, um, you know, from the newspaper reports, it may seem that just for a single dose of monoclonal antibodies, it might cost a few hundred dollars. How long can the protection from one dose last? So, the duration of, of an antibody uh, treatment response varies from antibody to antibody. So there is not a single number. Uh, it can range from dosing every week to once every few months. But the average tend to be around every two months. And factors that influence this uh, are, again, potency, and the half-life, how long it stays in circulation in, in the body. And other aspects as well, like for example, um, you know, how stable the molecule is. And um, all these factors would affect basically the, the duration, how often you need to inject those drugs. So assume the drug is very safe and you can concentrate it and inject it at high, high doses. And with some engineering as well for extension of half-life, you could definitely imagine an injection every six months, which seems quite reasonable. Uh, if you consider also 
the potency that would influence also how much is needed for each patient. So all these elements would be, um, you know, would play into that equation. So a treatment every two to six months to me sounds reasonable, especially consider, uh, the, uh, considering that you would integrate that into, um, you know, uh, healthcare policy and, and many other elements that have to be put in place. Uh, like you, we have currently in Singapore, you know, with, you know, the social distancing and, and also ensuring all other, other measures to, to limit the spread of, of the disease. I believe that's quite reasonable and the antibodies could have benefit for patients in a prophylactic setting uh, integrated with all the other, um, you know, measures that a government could put in place to help in that process. All right. But what if COVID-19 is also a vascular disease instead of just a pulmonary disease? How does that change the role of monoclonal antibodies? We, we are just understanding this. You know, it's a new disease and every day we learn something new. And uh, we have, uh, we benefit again from antibodies that have been developed previously. And there's a lot of clinical trials ongoing for, you know, some of the COVID-related conditions that are appearing. Uh, both for um, you know, coagulation conditions, as well as an overactivation of the immune system that some patients are seeing. So all the, this toolbox that we build over time is now uh, on the table and could potentially benefit uh, as we understand more and more how this disease works. So you know, the, uh, the, the coagulation problems uh, that we're seeing, or sorry, the, the clotting problems that we're seeing, uh, you know, or the overactivation of the immune system, uh, you know, we have the tools and we, we are learning more every day. And I believe that this would be problems that the doctors will be able to solve and be able to treat these patients to improve their conditions and, and be cured, basically. Right. So turning over to you, Piers, and just to build on you know, what Inisho had said, um, are there situations where monoclonal antibodies are not viable, such as if the cell-mediated immune response turns out to be critical? So I think the, um, the role of antibodies needs to be kind of uh, thought through very carefully as you're developing um, these programs. And I, I, I think a lot of that um, work has, has gone in at the front end um, of building programs to, to um, either treat um, or prevent um, infection. And I, I, I think the, um, clearly the role of, of T cell immunity um, may be protective um, in a certain fraction of the population who, um, for reasons we don't fully understand, already have um, a response. And that, that may be well why. Um, people have, uh, a majority of people have a pretty strong response to, to COVID and, and really have you know, minimal effect. The, the, the problem is the 1% who don't, right? So um, if we look at T cell um, response, yes, it's very important in um, helping patients overcome it. Um, but if we separate out the two, Having circulating antibodies at a sufficiently high level will be the, the very best way to ensure that we, we don't become infected. Um, you know, whether we achieve that through um, vaccination or whether we achieve that through the use of prophylactic antibodies, antibody comes into the body, it, it's bound up by, by the antibodies against the virus, and it, it's taken out of circulation before it really has a chance to, to cause infection. Um, if we think about the, the treatment of, of COVID, this is where patients have already become infected. Um, you know, the, the role of antibodies here um, predominantly is going to be to reduce the viral load, to try to um, give the body a, a chance to fight back um, with, with less copies of the virus um, circulating and, and replicating. Um, they are unlikely in and of themselves to, to be able to, um, to cure the patient. Um, but it's more about providing um, the, the space for the, the patient's immune system um, to, to mount a strong enough response, whether that's through innate or adaptive arms of the immune system, um, the, the, the T cells, the NK cells, the neutrophils, and so forth, that, that are kind of all of these compartments of the immune system that, that play, a, play a response. So what we're asking antibodies to do in that kind of um, 
prophylactic setting and that treatment setting is, is actually very different. Um, but I think that antibodies um, can play a really useful role um, in, both, um, in both contexts. Got it. Well, I understand that both Hummingbird and Dot Bio have to cut back on your regular work to focus on this research for COVID-19 monoclonals. So, Piers, is the knowledge and experience from your work on monoclonals transferable to your regular work at Hummingbird? <laughs> I, I think it's been um, a very interesting program um, to, to, to be involved in. Um, I, I think it's given us a lot of exposure to um, how quickly things could be done, um, as we discussed earlier. And I think that, uh, you know, we all hope that um, there are lessons that we can carry forward um, in terms of um, certain optimizations and platform processes that, you know, I said, uh, you know, a typical program takes 18 to 24 months. Um, and yet, you know, here we are doing programs in, in six, six months plus. Now, I think some of that um, shortening of timelines has been facilitated, as I said, by the, the phenomenal levels of cooperation in the industry um, and, you know, making people aware that you're doing something for, for COVID um, has meant that, you know, work gets done kind of at the top of the pile uh, because everybody understands the, the importance. So that, that kind of reprioritization has, has facilitated some of that. Um, and also the regulators have, um, you know, understood that, you know, these are exceptional circumstances um, and that a, a full safety program um, can um, can be developed kind of alongside the um, the development rather than kind of as, as a gating as it would be in a in a classical way in, in order to get into the clinic. So people have been really collaborative. So I think that that's that's accounted for probably fifty percent of the time saving. Um, and there are also, as I said, things that I think we've we've learned um, that can be optimized um, and uh, and certainly done um, in a more efficient manner. Um, now we've kind of really been pushed to to think about it and and allowed to um, to break away a little bit from the uh, the so-called normal uh, way of doing things. Mm, right. So, Inisha, what is the outlook for Dot Bio, given the public's awareness and interest in the benefits of monoclonal antibodies? Um, I think that uh, this pandemic has, uh, you know helped uh, create a certain awareness in the overall, uh, you know, uh, population about the importance of having a good healthcare system, having uh, accessible treatments, and having a um, strong biotech community and a strong biopharma community. So uh, I do think that the first benefit is general awareness of the overall public about, you know, what, what are we doing and what, what is what's an antibody and what is a vaccine and why is it important? And so that's, that's I believe, the first benefit that, that I see something as very positive. Um, you know, the, the overall perception of the industry has improved. And of course, uh, as a trickle down effect, it benefits uh, people like, like us that are, you know, uh, working in this area. Now, uh, more specifically from, uh, from this particular pandemic and what it involves for biotech companies like, like us is uh, a new level of understanding of certain processes and improving those certain processes for situations that require additional speed. And as Pierce was mentioning, um, you know, those type of uh, you know, knowledge that you get can be translated to other programs. And, you know, of course, it would not be the same exact same considerations from a regulatory perspective. But overall, if you look at um, antibody developments over time, and especially when programs need to be pushed faster, you can see that times have become shorter. So people have been able to improve on those processes. So all those are benefits for the overall biotech community. And I must say, from what I've seen in the community, people have been doing exceptional work and pushing, putting all the resources they could into progressing, uh, you know, treatments for for COVID. Um, for Dot Bio, it means that more people are aware of what we do. Uh, it means that uh, investors understand better what we do in general, and they see the value. Uh, and so all these elements would help in our communications down the line to be able to grow the company, to start new programs. And so I, I do, I am I'm quite, quite positive about the, the, the outcome or the, the, uh, the future for companies like us. 
uh, where you know being uh, dot bio or being hummingbird uh, companies they have very strong scientific teams they have the know-how in the biotech sector and that are pushing new therapies through protein engineering and through understanding of uh, biology uh, of these different diseases i believe that all those elements help a lot uh, on the awareness side for the public to understand what we do on our side to talk to investors and also to push our programs more efficiently towards the clinic. So I'm very positive about uh, the future. Um, and, and, and I do think that COVID has helped us uh, become better. Mm. So initial, just a follow-up question. You know, um, there are more than 75 monoclonal antibodies, but there have been many licenses to treat cancer as well as autoimmune diseases. Only three have been used to treat and prevent infectious diseases. So do you think, you know, more producers, you know, more farmers will be, you know, focusing on infectious diseases? Well, it's, it's a difficult question. Um, you know, pharmas or biotech companies have certain economic considerations to take into account. They have to, uh, you know, um, respond to investors that also want certain returns on their investments when they, when they invest into your company. So there are many considerations that at this particular junction, um, you know, have been excluded because it's a pandemic situation and we need treatments. But, uh, you know, on a regular situation, they bias certain treatments, a certain interest to certain areas, for example, cancer, mm -hmm. right? So I believe that the best response to uh, conditions that are perhaps less less common and that um, still require a lot of uh, you know of new therapies uh, to benefit patients is uh, a closer partnership with um, you know governments, funding agencies, and all the different players, being academic groups as well, so that those programs can also progress. So um, just to give you an example, in the U.S., they they have implemented this fast track program for rare diseases. And that has helped a lot develop new drugs in those areas that before were neglected. So there is definitely an element that where governments can contribute and where policy can make a difference. And, and I believe it has to be uh, a broader response, not just from the biotech or biopharma community, but, but from, uh, from the broader community in general to be able to uh, push new therapies in this uh, more neglected areas. All right. Okay. So how about, you know, let's go to the questions which are coming mm -hmm. from our audience. Sounds good. We have about, you know, four questions. Okay. All right. Let's, let's take, you know, this one about uh, the comment about the benefits of monoclonals, whether they are difficult to demonstrate. Um, yes, Piers, what, do you, what are your thoughts on this? Whether the benefits of monoclonals are difficult to demonstrate? You had you know, previously touched on it as well. Sure. I, I think, um, again, it gets to the question of what you're using it for. Um, for treating patients who are um, already seriously um, ill in the hospital is, is one setting. Um, treating patients who have just been diagnosed is, is another. Um, and you know, as we've discussed, prophylactic use um, in the community to prevent people getting infected. So, you know, could think of three very different kind of use cases for an antibody. Um, and the way that you would demonstrate benefit is, is, is very different in, in each of those. The, the, the prophylactic is, is somewhat the easiest. You know, you treat a thousand people with your antibody and you treat a thousand people with a placebo and you, you know, measure after three months the number of people who got an infection. That's a very easy endpoint um, to, to monitor. Um, I think for the patients who are um, hospitalized, um, it's much more complex. And I think we've seen that with um, actually all of the debate over the last six months um, around many of the, the repurposed small molecule um, agents, um, the uh, the antivirals um, and, and other mechanisms to uh, try to reduce the uh, symptoms. It's been very, very difficult to, to argue, you know, have we, have we reduced the mortality rate? Yes, perhaps, but also, you know, the, the doctors have got better at treating and better at um, understanding how to ventilate. So we can't compare to those historical data necessarily. Um, <clears throat> are the number of days in hospital reduced? 
Yes, possibly, but you know, have they been exposed to a slightly different strain? We've also started to treat patients who are severely ill with dexamethasone and, and other um, uh, kind of supportive care. So it's very difficult to, um, to demonstrate the benefits um, so cleanly in that context. Um, and so then you could look at, at surrogate markers of, of viral load and, and so forth. Um, and that may, may reduce it, but does that matter? Uh, and so that's actually kind of a, a lot more similar to the, the classic problems that we have when we do drug development is, is choosing appropriate endpoints for our studies in the clinic to understand does the drug actually make a meaningful impact um, on the course of disease and, and, and provide benefit to the patients. Um, so in, I would say in, in the treatment context, it needs serious thought. Um, in the prophylactic setting, as I said, it's, it's much simpler. Sure. Inisha, do you have any comments about these benefits of monoclonals, whether they are difficult to demonstrate? Yes, I think uh, Pierce has summarized it very well. Um, I, I would just add also that we are beginning a pandemic situation is unexpected. Uh, people are learning as we go, but the same way as um, Singapore has learned from the previous SARS, uh, you know, pandemic or you know the smaller outbreak of SARS that happened many years ago I think in the biotech community we could also learn from this particular one and also uh, be better prepared uh, with with better tools to measure things and also perhaps with more time if we prepare with new therapies beforehand so I, I do believe that there is here um, an opportunity to rethink how are we preparing for these kind of situations so that we don't have to be in the situation to know at the very last minute whether the new treatment works or not. So I just wanted to, to, to add that aspect, uh, but I agree it's very difficult uh, to, to, to measure right now uh, how effective each treatment is and we are improving on those processes um, as we learn more about the disease. Sure. Yes, I wanted to address that question before we segue into this question about ADE. So ADE, it may be a risk for the development of monoclonal antibodies. Um, Initial, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so, so this is the antibody dependent enhancement of a disease, right, that we're talking about. And it's very prevalent in Singapore this thought because it has been linked to um, some events for dengue treatment, right? Um, and it is definitely something to take into account uh, and to monitor uh, both for vaccines as well as for monoclonal antibodies. Um, but, you know, we have to see the data to see if it's a real risk or not. We have to monitor the clinical trials that are ongoing. It's too early to, to, to say. I would say that on the antibody space, there are things we can do uh, to prevent that. Um, you know, for example, these events typically can happen through the internalization, right? The antibody blocks the virus and then helps the virus internalize and infect new cells. That's one of the processes that this can happen. And there are ways to engineer antibodies against the internalization into cells. So again, antibody engineering can help mitigate the risk around, around this if they were to, uh, to be present in, in, in the therapies that we see coming uh, from the clinic. All right, okay. Thanks a lot, Inisho. Okay, let's take a look at the questions. I believe we have already answered the one about the six strains in circulation, that the strains are crossing continents. How about the one about the hype surrounding monoclonal antibodies, that there are still many unknowns out there? Um, Piers, what's your take on this? I'm, uh, I'm not sure if there's hype, um, <laughs> perhaps just in this crowd. Um, you know, I think they, as we've discussed, they, they have real promise. Um, I think we've got to be very careful to, to not hype potential solutions um, and, uh, and disappoint. Um, but of course, you know, the, the world also needs a little bit of a glimmer of hope sometimes. Um, and I think that... Um, the, the, the attention that monoclonal antibodies are getting um, is, is well deserved. They, they offer um, a, a very useful um, tool to, um, to mitigate some of the risk, uh, particularly as we've discussed in the context where the vaccines um, may not be so effective. And I think that the, the antibodies, um, for the reasons that we've discussed, um, 
have a very high chance of working, to be honest. I think we, we know enough about the mechanism of this disease. Um, we know, as, as we've discussed, um, how antibodies work, what we want antibodies to do. We see the preclinical data. Um, we see the emerging clinical data. We understand that patients who recover have these antibodies in them. That's where we are getting these antibodies from to, to treat. So I, th I think it's, it's, it's relatively well understood. The, um, the, the previous question about ADEs is a, is a very valid question, um, for sure. Um, and I think it's actually one of the reasons that, um, you know, to, to your earlier question about, you know, will the world suddenly start to work more on infectious diseases with, with antibody therapeutics? There are questions over that because of, you know, outstanding uh, points on the biology and, and outstanding risk that we, we may kind of wander into if we're not very thoughtful about it. But so far, the data that I've seen suggests that um, it, it's not a, a, a big issue um, or an issue at all um, in either the, um, the antibody or the, um, the vaccine space. Of course, it needs to be monitored extremely carefully going forward. So I, I think absolutely um, critical to make sure that we, we don't um, exacerbate the situation um, through a, a lack of due care and attention. Mm. Yes, uh, Piers, you know, just a follow-on from that, uh, Regeneron and Sanofi, they had developed a monoclonal antibody by the name of Sarilumab. Um, but this was, the phase three trial was stopped in July after 80% of the patients experienced adverse side effects. So what exactly are the possible side effects from monoclonals? Sure. So I, I think um, that, that, is, um, that is truly a, a curveball question because that's an antibody against um, a part of the immune system rather than the virus itself. And I think, you know, for, for the last hour, you know, we've been really focusing um, on, I think, the, the primary um, attention, which is new antibodies against the virus, um, rather than what this program was, which was a, a repurposing of um, an existing therapy, which tries to uh, modulate the immune response um, and try to suppress the immune response. Um, and so I think that, um, the considerations are, are definitely very valid. We, we do need to monitor for, for these things, um, but you should need to think very carefully um, and very, very distinctly between um, antibodies that are directly targeting the virus, as has been the focus of this hour, versus ones which are immune modulators and you know, can have great benefits, um, but also um, you know, very significant um, impact more broadly on the, the immune response if we're not careful and if we don't um, deeply understand um, how we are changing the immune response. All right. So gentlemen, you know, I'm mindful of time. It's now, you know, 5.01 p.m. Well, you know, thank you, Piers. Thank you, Inisho, for your time. Thank you very much for your insights. We have now come to the end of this webinar. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thank it you was so a, much pleasure. For organizing. a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so thank you everyone for making this a valuable experience to the audience. When you exit this webinar, you'll be directed to a short survey. We hope they can share your views for a quick minute so they can help us plan for future webinars and discussions. So thank you everybody. We hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.